Good to see everyone today. He was born in an obscure village, a child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. And then for three years he became an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book, he never held an office, he never had a family of his own or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through a mockery of a trial. He was executed by the state. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, and all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as this one solitary life. How many of you have heard that, or at least a version of that? Yeah, it's, it's been around. And it's obviously inspired by Jesus. What was it about Jesus that made him so special? Maybe it would be helpful to kind of eliminate some of the things that aren't answers to that question. What was it that made Jesus so special? Well, it wasn't his political connections. For some people in, in the world, pretty much any era, of time, you know, this, this is why they are remembered so well, because they had such powerful political connections. But you can't really say that about Jesus. Remember Jesus, uh, that short little conversation he had with Pilate. Pilate was asking him some questions, and Pilate was the governor, and he, he, Jesus wasn't saying anything in response, and Pilate finally says to him, he says, don't you realize I have the authority, I can either set you free, or I can have you executed? And Jesus responded to that by saying, you would have no authority at all unless it had been given to you from above. There wasn't any special connections Jesus had with, with Pilate or Caiaphas or any of those guys. When you look among the, the Jewish community, some of the more political-minded uh, people were the Sadducees. But yet, did Jesus run in those circles? Obviously not. He didn't get along with the Sadducees because of many of the things that they represented. So it wasn't the political connections that made Jesus so special. All right, well, could it be that he had such deep pockets? Yeah, well, if you've read any at all of Scripture, you know that that's not the case. In fact, Jesus on one occasion made this statement right there, there, this statement. Okay, there we go. Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus said, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. 
This, this is the passage that's actually found in a couple of the Gospels. But uh, this is the statement that Jesus made that has caused some people to say that Jesus didn't even own a pillow. Well, there's not actually a verse that flat out says that. But yet that's where they're getting it from is from this statement. It wasn't just a pillow. He didn't have a bed. He didn't own a bed. He didn't own a home. Yeah, to, to, to think that, well, Jesus, you know, he had such deep pockets and, you know, so a lot of times the movers and shakers, these are the people that, uh, you know, have a lot, of, a lot of wealth behind them. Well, that wasn't the case with Jesus. All right, another thing. Maybe it was his looks. At least in our culture, in our world today, uh, people hold in high esteem People who are beautiful people, right? And maybe Jesus was kind of the Fabio of the first century with a fan and his hair, you know, flying behind him. And I, you know, this has been something that people have discussed, and you've probably been in discussions as well. What exactly did Jesus look like? And some people think that maybe they got a little bit of an idea because we have some evidence. The Shroud of Turin, the burial cloth, Jesus' body after the crucifixion was covered with blood, and when he was wrapped in that cloth, you know, the, the blood left an imprint of his image. And so some say we have kind of an idea of what he looked like. Well, I'll just say this. The Shroud of Turin has more question marks attached to it than it has anything definitive. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that. It might surprise you to know that there actually is a verse in the Bible that talks about Jesus' looks, his appearance. You know, oftentimes when this topic comes up, people kind of forget about this particular verse. And part of the reason for that is because it's found in an unlikely place. You would think that if we're talking about what Jesus looked like, it would probably be in the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But rather instead, you see it in the writings of the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem. It was part of the prophet prophetic message that Isaiah had. And here's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, verse 2. He said, he grew up like a small plant before the Lord, like a root growing in a dry land. He had no special beauty or form to make us notice him. There was nothing in his appearance to make us desire him. Okay, so there's not a whole lot of specifics attached to that, right? It doesn't tell you how long his sideburns were or how long his hair was or, you know, any of that kind of stuff, whether he had a long nose or not. Or, but what it does tell us is that he was pretty ordinary looking. So it wasn't his looks that set him apart. Now, we, you know, we've got, we've got all kinds of Some of us, we don't even think there's a question about it because we have certain images, you know, of Jesus that have been floating around for a long time. And most of those images, though, if you think about it, you know, they have them uh, with a fair complexion. And, or you think about some of the movies and some of the actors that have played the role of Jesus. And so we kind of think along these lines, but, but we forget some of the most obvious truths, and that is Jesus was a Jewish man. So his hair would have been dark. His skin would have been darker. His eyes would have been dark. And he probably would have looked more along these lines. Maybe than any of the other images that seem to float around about Jesus. But again... We're scratching this one from the list because this isn't what made him so special. It wasn't his political connections. It wasn't that he had deep pockets. It wasn't that he was, was such an outstandingly handsome or beautiful person. Those aren't the answer. So what is the answer? What is it that made Jesus or what is it that makes Jesus so special? 
It's pretty amazing when you think about it. Without question, he's the most controversial person in human history. I mean, it's been 2,000 years since he walked here on earth. He was born in a dinky town that none of us would have known anything about that town had he not been born there. He grew up in another town that basically, for all intents and purposes, was considered to be a town on the other side of the tracks. Remember what Nathaniel's reaction was as soon as he found out that Jesus was from Nazareth? He's, his immediate reaction, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It didn't have the greatest reputation. Jesus grew up during a time, and his ministry was during a time when obviously there was not any television, there was no radio, and certainly no internet, yet people are still talking about him today on every continent on earth. So again, what is it that makes Jesus so special? I think the answer to that actually is a combination of a couple of things. It was who he is, and it was what he did. And that's what I want to talk about today. So let's talk about who he is. Sometimes people today, and I'm in particular talking about critics of Christianity, um, people today argue that Jesus himself never claimed to be anything special. Instead, they say that this whole idea of Jesus being the so-called son of God was something that was attached to him at a later point in time by some overzealous followers. They say that Jesus never ever saw himself as being anything beyond just being a teacher or a rabbi. Yeah, that's the argument that's made, and if you've done enough reading and all, you've, you've picked up on that along the way. There's a, some obvious problems with that kind of an explanation uh, because it becomes obvious that people haven't spent any time reading, you know, and what the scripture records for us. Let's check out a couple of the claims that Jesus made. And it's going to take a few minutes to go through these two passages, and each one of them, one's like eight verses long, and the other one's going to be nine or ten verses long. But yet, it's well worth our time in order to clearly imprint in our mind what Jesus had to say about himself. Okay? This first one is an encounter that he had with uh, some folks in John chapter 8. Jesus says this, starting in verse 51. I assure you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death ever. Then the Jews said, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and so did the prophets. So basically the reaction that people are giving to Jesus right when he says, if you keep my word, you will never see death. They're like saying, that's crazy talk. I mean, what in the world are you what are you trying to say? And they think of the most prominent, most important, most significant person in Judaism in their faith, and that is Abraham, the father of the faith. And they say, even Abraham died, and so did the prophets. And yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death ever. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And they intended that to be a rhetorical question. Because the answer is obvious, you are not greater than Abraham. That was their attitude. That was their perspective on things. Even the prophets died. Who do you pretend to be? Because remember, they're, th they're working on the assumption here, this is crazy talk coming out of your mouth. And so who, who are you in your twisted way of looking at things? is basically what they're asking. Jesus says this in response. If I glorify myself, Jesus answered, my glory is nothing. My father, you say about him, he is our God. He is the one who glorifies me. You've never known him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham, oh boy, here it comes. Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. Now, if they had a problem with what he just said in, in verses 51 and 52, 
they're going to have a major issue with this statement. He's saying, your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. How did they react to that? Very next verses. The Jews replied, you aren't 50 years old yet. Okay, he was in his early 30s at this particular point. You aren't 50 years old yet, and yet you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. At that, they picked up stones to throw at him. What, were they just getting so frustrated they didn't know what else to say? So they said, let's start throwing rocks at him. No. No, they, they actually were doing something that is recorded back here in the Old Testament law. That if a person was guilty of blasphemy, the punishment was stoning them to death. So they saw what Je they heard what Jesus was saying. He was claiming to be equal to God. He made that statement before Abraham was. And Abraham had lived hundreds of years earlier. But yet Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the bell didn't ring in our mind automatically, though it may have in some of your minds. But it doesn't, doesn't ring as automatically in our mind today um, because we didn't grow up the way many of the people listening to him grew up. Back in those days, you know, people didn't have their own individual copy of the Bible. And, and there was some real blessing in having you know, a copy of scripture, whether it be on your smartphone or your computer or, your, or in a book like this. But at the same time, it has a way of making us a little bit lazy because we don't memorize scripture, you know, as much as what they did back in those days. They had, they didn't have the New Testament, but they had what we call the Old Testament. And what, what at a very young age, you would memorize lengthy passages of Scripture because people didn't have their own personal copy of the Bible. And so this was something that was in people's minds. And so they knew the great stories of, of the Old Testament. And so, so when, when Jesus makes this statement, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am, they immediately began developing a visual of a burning bush and Moses standing at the burning bush and talking to God. And God was giving him instructions to go into Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go and to lead the people out of bondage. And what was Moses' reaction? Moses was like, like, well, they're going to ask me, who sent me? And I don't know what to tell them. And what was it that God, speaking through the burning bush, what was it that God said? Tell them, I am that I am has sent you, which is the name Yahweh. That's what Yahweh means, I am. And basically on this occasion, what Jesus is saying, because these guys are just like, man, come on, what are you talking about? You're crazy. You know, Abraham never saw you, never looked to you and all this. And he says, I assure you before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is saying, I am the one that was speaking at the burning bush. That's me. I am God. That's why they started picking up stones. Because they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept that. But what we're trying to establish is what was Jesus claiming? And it's pretty clear in this passage. Let me show you another one. We'll go a couple of chapters. A different setting, different occasion. Um, but yet the outcome is not going to be that much different. Here's the way it reads in John chapter 10, starting in verse 24. Then the Jews surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Okay, so they're basically asking the same sort of question that they did last time. You know, last time it was like, Who do you think that you are? That's the way the John 8 passage started. Well, here, they're basically asking the same question. They're just saying, Tell us. Tell us who you are. And Jesus responded and said, I did tell you, and you didn't believe. 
The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you don't believe because you are not my sheep. There's a key statement there. The works that I do in my Father's name testify. Um, Basically, what Jesus is saying there is that his miracles, you know, when he would give sight to the blind or he would help those that were lame to walk or when he was walking on water or when he felt fit, a fed, a multitude, when he was doing these different things, these miracles were never intended to be ends in themselves. But these miracles, they not only relieved whatever the issue was for the people that were struggling or suffering at that time, but there was even a a more far-reaching purpose behind the miracle, and that was to attest to Jesus' authority in saying that what he is teaching is accurate. And that's the point that he's making here. And so they're saying, tell us. Don't keep us in suspense anymore. And Jesus says, I've already told you. How many times are you going to need to hear this? And he goes on and says this. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish, ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Ooh, is that saying what it kind of looks like it's saying? Well, let's see how the people react to it. Again, the Jews picked up stones, picked up rocks to stone him. Jesus replied, I've shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these works are you stoning me for? And they're, they're going to make it clear. We aren't stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. So there can be no doubt why they're picking up the stones, because this passage goes into detail in explaining it. But you see, both of these different passages, and these are just two of them, there's others, but both of these are showing what Jesus' claims were. The whole kind of thinking that Jesus was just a a rabbi and that some overzealous followers of his, you know, started attaching, you know, thoughts about Jesus being the Son of God and stuff like this that Jesus never had ever claimed for himself, uh, that's without basis. Because you look at passages like this and you begin to see how major some of Jesus' claims were. And this explains why elsewhere in the New Testament you start seeing stuff like this in Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17 in reference to Jesus. Actually, reading both chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Colossians does a really good job of impressing upon us you know, how important Jesus is. But in these two verses, it says, He created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they are kings or lords, rulers or powers. Everything is being created through him and for him. He existed before everything and holds everything together. So in reference to Jesus, it's saying he's the creator. He's the one that's created all things, and he's the one that sustains all things. You know, people marvel about the orbits of the different planets in our solar system and all of this, and, you know, and how, how you know, all of that, how's all that work? Well, it's telling us right there. He's the one that holds all this together. He's the one that holds it all together. You continue to read in Colossians, you get into chapter 2, and... Uh, Makes no bones about it. In verse 9 it says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Make no mistake about it. Jesus, while he was here on earth, he was in a human body. If you cut him, he would bleed, as he did. But he was also God. He was fully God. And so you see this in numerous passages. Hebrews chapter 1, the opening verses of that book, says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And through whom he also made the universe. There's that statement again, that, that all things were created 
through Jesus. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. I find it interesting um, the way John begins his gospel account. The way he approaches telling the story of Jesus. You know, we have four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three of those, perhaps you've heard of this before, they're called the synoptic Gospels, which basically means same, the word synoptic. Um, and it's not that they're identical to one another, but they do share a lot of the same teachings, a lot of the same miracles, a lot of the same um, events that, that played out, that are recorded in them. They're not carbon copies of one another by any means, but they are very similar to one another. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John, John kind of took a different approach to things when he was telling the story of Jesus. His is kind of unique because John focuses, as much as anything, he focuses more on the person of Jesus. The others, they, they seem to be focusing on the miracles. They seem to be focusing on the teachings of Jesus. But John really, really zooms in on the person of Jesus. Mark starts his gospel off with the baptism of Jesus. That's where he begins. Uh, Matthew and Luke, they begin basically with the conception of Jesus, you know, by the message being delivered to uh, uh, Mary that she would become pregnant. But John, what he does, he kind of leapfrogs right over the top of all of that. And he's like, you want to hear, you want to hear the story of Jesus? Well, let me tell you the story of Jesus. And he goes way back and the opening words of his gospel say, in the beginning was the word. Now, again, a bell ought to ring in your mind because that sounds familiar in the beginning. Yeah, it sounds like Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That's not an accident. That's totally intentional. John was wanting people to think about the beginning. If you want to hear the story of Jesus, you need to go before Bethlehem. You need to go before Jesus' baptism. You need to go way back to the beginning. And that's what John is doing here. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, someone might look at that and say, wait a minute, it doesn't say Jesus, it's saying Word. Well, let's get a sneak peek down in verse 14. The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed His glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So it's talking about Jesus here. Okay, But he's using the word word in the opening verses. And so Jesus was in the beginning. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Now if this is true, you would kind of expect there to be perhaps some evidence when you study the early part of the Bible. You would expect maybe to see something back there. And sure enough, when you take a look and take a close look, you don't even need to study in the original language of Hebrew. You can look in an English translation and you will see evidence of it. You'll see like in Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter of the Bible, it's talking about the six days of creation. And by the time you get to verse 26, it is dealing with the sixth day of creation when mankind was created. And it says this. And what I want you to notice are the pronouns here. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, all the earth, and so on. But you notice the plural pronouns. Now, if you want to study it in the Hebrew, study it in the Hebrew. You'll see that they're there. But the English, in most translations, and the ones that don't are kind of questionable, as to why they don't, because it is in Hebrew. 
They're using the plural pronouns. And just for the record, we are, you and I, we're not created in the image of angels. And so it's not God talking to angels, let's make man in our image. We're not created in their image. This is God the Father and God the Son that are speaking. And this certainly jives with all these other passages that we're talking about. In John chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, talks about Jesus being the one that was creating all things. You go a couple chapters later, and this is where sin gets introduced into the equation in Genesis chapter 3. And again, notice the pronouns. It says, the Lord God said, since man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. And there's more. There, there's more back in Genesis, but uh, those serve to illustrate the point. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And like all these other passages are saying, John brings this to the very forefront in verse 3. All things were created through him and apart from him. Not one thing was created that has been created. There is nothing that has been created apart from Jesus. There's no mountain. There's uh, um, no ocean. There's no planet. There's no galaxy. Nothing has been created apart from Jesus. You know, the reality of the matter is, and, and this is kind of a cool thought to think, is is that it's not just that Jesus was in the beginning. It's that he was the beginner. He's the one that began things. He's the one that created them. This clearly sets Christianity apart from any of these other religions that people like Joseph Smith got started or Confucius or Muhammad or Buddha or a whole host of other people that originated some religion in the world. This sets Christianity apart. All these other religions in the world, they, they seem to stress the importance of their teachings or ceremonies or rituals of one type or another. But in regards to Jesus, the focus of his message ultimately was on himself, who he is. And that's why you'll find so many passages of Scripture where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he goes on and expands from that. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. Or this particular passage that uh, is something we talked about it a few Sundays ago because uh, uh, Christian, Christians kind of take a lot of heat for this because it doesn't seem to be very tolerant. But this is what Jesus said in John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a pretty major statement. Major statement. Why is that true? How is that true? We need to talk about what it is that Jesus did when he came. So we've spent some time talking about who he is. But let's talk about what he did in the remainder of our time. Jesus accomplished a number of things while he was here. He set an example for us as to how we ought to go about living our life. You know, that's a good pattern to look at and to get direction and inspiration from. But that wasn't the bottom line primary reason Jesus came into the world, to set an example for you and me. He accomplished it. But that's not the main reason. Jesus came and testified to the truth. And boy, that's important in a world that's filled with a lot of mistruth. And, but yet that's not even the bottom line reason as to why Jesus came into the world. Jesus revealed God the Father to us. 
As a matter of fact, in that opening chapter I kept talking about in John chapter 1, years ago, a few verses later, after it says they took on flesh and made his dwelling among us, it says, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Jesus has revealed God the Father to us. But even that isn't the primary reason why Jesus came. There's more to it, something much more that he came into the world to do. And I'm going to give you a word, and it can, it can, it can, uh, uh, this one word kind of contains the answer, bottom line, as to why Jesus came in to this world. And this is, this is a word that is in your Bible. It's in your Bible multiple times, but I will venture to guess, and I do this with pretty good confidence, that not a one of us in here had spoke this word this week, because this is not a word that we use in, in our uh, common vocabulary. Now, this group down here is a lot bigger than the group upstairs. I made a deal with them that if any one of them can claim to have used this word and can somehow verify that to me, I will eat cooked spinach next Sunday. <laughs> and I can't think of anything more disgusting to eat than cooked spinach. Um, but here's the word. Here it is. It's a Bible word. Propitiation. Yeah, it's there. It's there in your Bible, and it's there multiple times. Certain Bibles maybe use a different, a different particular word, but if you're using a, a, a Bible that uh, is anywhere from mid-range to to, you know, be an extremely literal word for word, uh, this word is always being used, whether it be the New American Standard, the Christian Standard Bible, the, the King James, the New King James, the English Standard Version. I mean, all of those translations are all using this word. You get into some, some of the translations that uh, take a few more liberties, they might insert a different word there. Propitiation. There are four primary places that this word surfaces in the New Testament, though the concept behind the word is found all over the place. But I want to show you, and these are on your outline, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on them, but I do want to show them so we can read them together, what these four passages are. First of all, you have Romans chapter 3, verse 25, and it says this, God presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. Okay, so in the early part of Paul's writing to the church in Rome, you know, he makes a statement here about propitiation and he's making a connection between propitiation and the blood of Jesus. Okay, so you can't divorce the blood of Jesus from this work. It's directly tied to it. Here's another one. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. And just so you know, verse 17, for the sake of time, we're only reading that verse. But if you really want to get a running start at what's being said in this passage, you need to start at verse 14 and read to verse 17. But here's, here's the way it reads. He had to be made like his brethren in all things. And what it's talking about in the previous verses is taking on flesh and blood, a physical body like you and me, becoming a human, a human being, okay? That's what's being spoken of in the previous verses. He had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. All right, so blood in the previous passage is directly tied to propitiation. Here, having a physical body, becoming a human being, um, is directly tied to propitiation. Here's the third one, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Propitiation is directly tied to sins. It has something very specific to do with sins, our sins. 
Okay, now we're ready for the fourth one. And this one, by the way, is your memory verse this week. 1 John 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, so it's real clear. Jesus became the propitiation. He took on a physical body. His blood was involved in it. And it had something to do with the removal of our sins. So what's behind this word? I mean, it's one thing to have these passages of Scripture and uh, to know ooh, propitiation is a really um, important concept in, in the whole gospel story. Uh, it's one thing to know that, but it's another thing to be able to actually wrap your mind uh, at least partially around what does all of this mean. So let me, let me take a stab at this. Here is the situation. If you're going to understand the word propitiation, you've got to start with this. And, and it's the fact that we all have sinned. I have sinned and you have sinned. Okay? I mean, we can't deny that. I have sinned and you have sinned. And whoever comes in the next service and sits in your chair, they have sinned. The people that are sitting in the row next to you, they have sinned. The out-of-town family that came to worship with you today, they have sinned. Okay? We all have sinned. And the Bible goes as far as to say that if we deny that fact, if, if, if we were to say, well, yeah, but I'm an exception to that and I haven't sinned, then we are liars and we're calling God a liar. And I've included those verses in, in your outline so you can actually see where that is in the scripture. It says that. So we have sinned and it's something we can't deny. And the ba very basic meaning of sin is we've missed the mark. We've disobeyed God. We've fallen short. Okay, now this is where things start getting really complicated. Since God is just, he must punish sin. And if he doesn't punish sin, then God is not just. He, de he, he denies his very nature. It's real easy for people to kind of say, well, yeah, but God, God, can't, can't he just look the other way? Can't God just kind of be like a grandfather type and he just saw something that we shouldn't have been doing and he's just like, all right, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that. I'm going to sweep it under the rug. Well, the fact of the matter is that if God just sweeps our sin under the rug and pretends it doesn't exist and just ignores it, then he denies his very nature and he ceases to be a just God. So he can't do that because he is a just God. There are consequences to sin. And those consequences have to be realized. But God is also love, which means he doesn't want to see anyone perish. And this is what people gravitate toward. They really like this particular concept of, of who God is, that God is love, and they, they just want to they want to focus on this to the exclusion of everything else. But you can't do that. Yes, God is love. And he doesn't want to see anyone perish. But the fact is, God is also just. And the consequences of sin have to be realized. So what's the answer to to this dilemma because in many ways that's what it is it's a dilemma the only way that he could effectively punish sin and yet save the sinner is if he came and personally paid the penalty himself and that's exactly what he did in Jesus Christ Jesus came and Jesus towed the line. He lived a perfect life. He never fell short. And that qualified him to step in and be your substitute and to be my substitute. To take the punishment of our sin, to take that upon himself and in exchange to give us his righteousness. 
You see, that's what's behind this whole idea of propitiation. It basically is, is literally, the word means to redirect the wrath of God off of us and onto himself. That's what propitiation is. And that's exactly what Jesus did by coming into the world. Listen, what happened on the cross? It both satisfied God's justice and simultaneously demonstrated his love for us. You know, the Bible clearly communicates that God really wants you to one day be in heaven with him. This is something that the Bible teaches loud and clear that God wants you to be in heaven with him. And he has gone out of his way to make that possibility um, a reality for you. But you've got to understand Jesus is the key to that. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because Jesus is the one who came and did what had to be done to be able to free you up, to be able to have a home in heaven. And that's why Jesus said what he said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is why you read in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, these words. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who doesn't have the Son of God does not have life. Everything hinges on Jesus. This is what makes Jesus so special. And so the question that you've got to ask yourself is, where do I stand with Jesus? Because what we're talking about here, what Jesus came into the world and what he willingly did um, is not something that just automatically gets applied to you. Because God is not going to force his love upon you. You need to open your heart and you need to receive it. It's a decision that only you can make. Your mom can could not and cannot make that decision for you. Your spouse cannot make that decision for you. It is a decision that you and only you can make for yourself. And if you look back over your shoulder and you see that, oh, I've never done that. I just figured this was all something that happens by osmosis. It doesn't work that way. You need to open yourself up and receive the gift that God has made available to you. And I want to encourage you to, to pull me aside, pull Brad Fogel aside, you know, Ben, talk, talk to one of us. We'd be more than happy to pray with you. Our ushers are going to be getting up at this time, preparing for our time of communion. And uh, here's what I want to end with. Um, it's kind of ironic when you think about it. Here in a moment, uh, the, the trays that are going to be passed, um, you're invited to share in this time if you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, take a piece of bread, eat it, take uh, a cup of juice and drink it. And while you're doing that, to, to reflect on the blood and the body of Jesus. What happened on the cross, what he did on your behalf. This whole propitiation concept. Um, and while you're doing that, I want to give you a thought to think, think about. The cross and what happened with Jesus there on that cross. On the one hand, it represents the wrath of God at its worst. Okay? But on the other hand, it represents the love of God at its best. It's kind of all at the same time. The wrath of God at its worth. The wrath of God directed against sin. But it's also the love of God at its best. Because Jesus came and said, I'll take that for her. I'll take that for him. Let me die in her place. This is why we celebrate. 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this is why 20 centuries later we're still talking about it. We're still excited. For good reason. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity this morning to talk about a topic that certainly is not a fringe topic as far as Christianity goes, but rather it is at the very heart, at the very core of what the gospel is all about. Lord, we celebrate. We celebrate what we have in Christ. It's incredible. Because we're so undeserving. And I think everyone in here would echo that. But yet it's your love that reaches beyond whether or not we deserve. Your love reaches into our life and gives us what we don't deserve. And that's why it's called grace. We celebrate your love and your grace. What Jesus accomplished when he went to the cross on our behalf. And Lord, we'll not only spend this time expressing our gratitude, but we will spend the rest of our lives and we will spend eternity expressing our gratitude for what you mean to us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.